There are times in history when having a delusional leader isn't going to affect much. Now is not one of those times. We're living in an age when the everyday decisions of delusional leaders are costing thousands of lives. Western nations worked tirelessly to promote the Arab Spring in Tunisia and Libya and Egypt and Syria and Bahrain based on the most empirically falsifiable assumption in history, namely that all people really want is peace and democracy. As the protests turned into violent riots, calls for jihad, demands for Sharia and outright civil war, our leaders waited patiently for reality to suddenly line up with their theories. They're still waiting. ISIS could have been stopped more than a year ago by diverting a few million dollars worth of supplies to the right people. But our leaders laughed at ISIS. There's no way this sort of brutal extremism will ever catch on. In the land of the religion of peace, the peaceful Muslims just won't stand for it. How's that theory working out for everyone? ISIS could have been at least contained even before that by not withdrawing troops from Iraq until it was safe to do so. But President Obama was convinced without the slightest bit of evidence, apart from the liberal nonsense he absorbed at Columbia and Harvard, that the only reason there are any jihadists in the Middle East is that the United States keeps bothering them. Just pull out the troops and praise Islam and the hearts of jihadists will melt at the gentle gesture. Fast forward through the epic bloodbaths and beheadings and rape fests that followed. Have our leaders learned anything? No, facts simply cannot penetrate their ivory towers, which is why I'm starting to think that our current leaders are a hopelessly lost cause and that we should be looking to the future of Western leadership. But to avoid the inexcusable mistakes of the past, I suggest we give potential world leaders a pop quiz. Take some issue that's enormously confusing to our current leaders, but that wouldn't be confusing at all to a slightly informed five-year-old. There are plenty of examples here, but let's look at one, the importance of jihad to the Muslims who wage it. Why is jihad so important to certain Muslims that they'll leave their homes, their friends, and their families to travel to a distant land they've never seen before and lay down their lives for Allah? It's a jobs problem, right? We'll start the quiz by reading a few short passages from Islam's most trusted source on the life of Muhammad, Sahih al-Bukhari. Sahih al-Bukhari, 2785. A man came to Allah's messenger and said, guide me to such a deed as equals jihad and reward. He replied, I do not find such a deed. According to Muhammad, is there any deed that brings greater reward from Allah than jihad? No. Sahih al-Bukhari, 2787. Muhammad said, Allah guarantees that he will admit the mujahid, someone who wages jihad, in his cause into paradise if he is killed. Otherwise, he will return him to his home safely with rewards and war booty. Allah guarantees paradise to the jihadist. So if you want assurance of salvation, if you want to know where you're going when you die, what do you need to do? You need to go fight the unbelievers and the hypocrites. Sahih al-Bukhari, 2795. The prophet said, Nobody who dies and finds good from Allah in the hereafter would wish to come back to this world, even if he were given the whole world and whatever is in it, except the martyr who, on seeing the superiority of martyrdom, would like to come back to the world and get killed again in Allah's cause. Once you make it to paradise, where you get to spend eternity deflowering virgins, there is nothing that would make you want to come back to this world except martyrdom because of the reward you get from Allah by dying for him while waging jihad. Sahih al-Bukhari, 2796. The Prophet said, a single endeavor of fighting in Allah's cause in the afternoon or in the forenoon is better than all the world and whatever is in it. According to Muhammad, what's the greatest thing in the world? Love, friendship, marriage, nice house, democracy, freedom, no, the greatest thing in the world is fighting and dying for Allah in a jihad. Sahih al-Bukhari 2797. Muhammad said, By him in whose hands my soul is, I would love to be martyred in Allah's cause, and then come back to life, and then get martyred, and then come back to life again, and then get martyred, and then come back to life again, and then get martyred. In chapter 33, verse 21 of the Quran, Allah declares that Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for Muslims. As we've seen, Muhammad says that he would love to die while waging jihad and then come back to life so he can fight some more and then die again, and then come back to life so he can fight some more and then die again. Pop quiz. Is it possible for these passages to play any role 
in the behavior of any Muslims ever? Is it even possible for Muhammad's commands about jihad to affect what Muslims do? Many of our current leaders would answer no. They believe that there is an impenetrable wall between what Muhammad commands about jihad and what Muslims do. These leaders are willing to rest the safety of the world and of all future generations on a wall that exists nowhere outside of their own delusional minds. So we turn to the future. Potential leaders of the future. If you answer no to the question, is it possible for Muhammad's commands about jihad to influence Muslims, you fail the leadership quiz. You are carrying some serious ideological baggage that's going to get lots of people killed if you are ever given the task of making decisions for Western nations. So if you answer no, do the world a favor and choose another line of work. May I suggest unicorn stable boy or girl?